Okay, welcome back to members of 121 Community Church in Grapevine, Texas. And we're going to continue on now in uh, Corinthians chapter 10. And in this lesson, we're going to actually learn a brand new doctrine by Paul. It's situated in ethics, that's why it hasn't come up before. But in this lesson, uh, Paul is going to teach the doctrine of phronimos, and that is situated in Corinthians 10.15. And it's a critical, critical doctrine about practical ethical mind. Practical ethical mind. And so we want to have a few introductory comments about the concept itself. To begin with, it is in a 1 Corinthians 1.15, and there it is translated as sensible ones. Paul's speaking to the sensible ones, the practical thinkers. It combines two concepts, the concept of friend, to reflectively enclose the situation and thought, and saphos, skilled in the interpretation of dialogue or dialectic. So when you take these two compound words, its a true definition is practical ethical mind. To be capable of grasping a situation and forming an ethical plan of action for ministry, it can be sensate based or it can be pneuma based. And for Paul, we know it is Christ based. It is Christological. His ethics is always Christological ethics. But it is this uh, ability to actually grasp a, situ a situation dialectically to uh, reflectively analyze it, and to map out a plan of ministry. So we'll take a look at this doctrine. It's in 10.5 uh, through 17. We'll begin with block one. We're going to take a look at uh, the uh, posited signs in the scriptures. And Paul says that uh, God was not pleased with the Israelites during the Exodus and he uh, therefore posited them throughout the wilderness as a judgment. And so Paul is introducing a, a warning here concerning the divine judgment. But in verse 6 he says, uh, This and all Exodus narratives are given as a sign for us, they are a topoi sign for us to prevent us from becoming those who also desire evil, as did these Israelites who sinned during the first exodus. So Paul says, look, we're given this example as a sign to direct us toward the true kingdom and to prevent us from failing and falling into sin. And then he goes on in verse 7 and he says, uh, And so don't become idolaters, as some of them were, because it was written back in the scriptures and the Torah that the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. So he said this uh, judgment came upon the original Israelites during the Exodus, because of their lapse back into sin and sensuality. So Paul is warning the Corinthians don't fall into this trap. This past narrative is a sign narrative, and as a sign narrative is to teach you what to avoid and what to be cognitive of. Now in block two he says, uh, he wants to go on to say, do not tempt Christ's patience. He says, uh, he begins by saying, of course, likewise, don't commit any act of pornography because back during the original Exodus, 23,000 were slain and fell in one single day. So it goes on to say in verse 9, therefore, don't test Christ the Lord. As some of them did, some of those original Israelites did during the first exodus. 
Paul claims Christ was present at the Exodus event. Paul claims that's key for the pre-existence of Christ. He claims Christ was present at the first Exodus. And he says those 23,000 were destroyed by serpents. And he goes on to warn, don't grumble, don't complain, as some of those also did, and ended up perishing by that serpent destroyer. That's the term used here, serpent destroyer. So I got a little bit of a uh, closing triad here for blocks one and two. If you look at block two, note four, therefore the scriptures are filled with positive signs for our ethical edification. We are to negate, to negate all pornography. In this way, we do not test Christ's patience and lordship. It's all about paying attention to the signs in scripture, says Paul. Pay attention to the signs in scripture that point beyond themselves to that which is significant for the Christ-centered ethical life. And that takes us on to this empowerment for ethics in block three. And Paul says that uh, these significations happened as our examples. They were uh, written down in scripture for our admonition, for us to learn from and to be guided by. And he says it is for, and this is key, it's especially for these narratives, these sign narratives are especially for this generation that is living during the apocalyptic age. <coughs> Paul says that the sign narratives are for those who currently live in the apocalyptic age because the resurrection of Christ has taken place at the end of the corrupt age and the inauguration of the apocalyptic age. He says, therefore, to all of you who think you stand, pay attention to this, lest you fall into temptation and sin. But he does conclude with that famous verse 13 that we all know about, where Paul concludes with the axiom that no temptation has taken hold of you, that isn't common to all humanity, and God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond that which you would be able to overcome because along with the temptation, he provides the power to escape. Paul says there is dunamis, spiritual power available during temptation for the believer in order to find a path of escape, a path of overcoming temptation. Paul says this is a provision and a promise in the gospel. We are provided a spiritual strength, the dunamis power of the spirit to overcome temptation. So I've got an inserted uh, triad here in block three. To the right, we've got Catastrano Topoi, Positive signs fill the scriptures. And then Nuthasia, we are to give attention to these narratives. They are for edification during the apocalyptic age. And then three, in this way we are empowered for our ethics of topoi signs. So we are empowered to overcome temptation, says Paul. Paul teaches an ethic which includes spiritual empowerment. Additionally, he's going to teach the, in the concluding comments of column four, he's going to teach the doctrine of the ethical mindset, the ethical mindset. So let's go to column four and take a look at the concept of a uh, phronimos. And in 14, he says, therefore, beloved, flee from idolatry. And he says in 15, to those of you who have an ethical mind, a practical ethical mind, I'd like to say the following. I would like you to judge for yourselves what I posit as the truth. So he says, look, for those of you who are concerned about the truth, for those of you who are concerned about 
practical, ethical action and discernment. To all of you who think in that way, please consider what I am positing to be the truth in Christ. Evaluate it, internalize it. So it gives the admonition to listen, critique, and internalize. And he goes on to say, in a powerful way, that uh, there is a consecrated blessing that we bless, and is this not the communion of the blood of Christ? And the bread that we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? So Paul says that empowerment that I talked about and the truth that I want you to consider is that our communion, our holy communion and the sacrament of the bread and the wine in remembrance of Christ is a consecrated blessing of communion with the blood of Christ and the body of Christ. And then in verse 17 he says, uh, and we are all partakers of this one bread, the one body of Christ, even though we are many, even though we are diverse, we take part in one holy communion. We partake of the same bread, the same spiritual, Christological nourishment and fellowship. So we have a, conclusi a conclu conclusive triad in note 5, and it consists of the fact of uh, eulogia, our ethical life is consecrated blessing, and then koinonia, haima, and soma, our ethical mind is empowered through the Holy Communion with Christ's body and Christ's blood. And then 3, for nimas, then we attain in putting on practical ethical mind of Christ. The new mind of Christ is the practical ethical mind. Paul never resided in the abstract or the theoretical. He always drove home practical truth. So he says, the new mind that I've been teaching, the ethics of new mind, is the ethics of practical new mind, practical ethical mind. It's the doctrine of phronimos. So eulogia, we are consecrated in the spirit. Koinonia, we enter into communion, holy communion with the Spirit. And then for Nimas, we are empowered for practical ethical mind by the Spirit. So our recall triad would be eulogia, koinonia, and for Nimas. Consecration, communion, and ethical mind. Consecration, communion, and ethical mind. We want to go from here. We want to definitely address the fact that uh, Paul is teaching in this lesson, if you look back there to block one, about the topoi, about the fact that the scriptures contain signs for the apocalyptic age. The scriptures contain signs pointing to Christ in the Torah, in the prophets, in the wisdom literature of the Old Testament. There are signs that point to Jesus Christ as Messiah. They've been posited there by the kingdom of God and for the kingdom of God for those who are living now in the apocalyptic age. He says, therefore, if we live in the apocalyptic age and if we live in dialogue with these signs of the Christ in the Torah, then don't test the Lord. I have proclaimed to you that Jesus Christ is the curious Lord. Not Caesar, not any power, not any potentiality, not any secular leadership, not any king. Christ is Curios Lord, not Caesar. Christ is Curios Lord and do not test, do not tempt his lordship, do not test his patience. You've been given apocalyptic signs in the Torah. You've been given apocalyptic signs, apocalyptic narratives to instruct you. Therefore, live the life of sanctification. You've been justified, so live as sanctified. Live unto sanctification. Live ethically. Live with the empowerment of 
practical, ethical mind. Phronimas. Phronimas that combines friend and safas. The capability of grasping a situation and forming an ethical plan of action for ministry which is based on the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ for Paul. Christ-centered, practical, ethical mind. Take up this mind, imprint your heart, imprint your mind, and live in Christological centeredness. This is Paul's doctrine of phronimas, the doctrine of phronimas. It all does center on 10.15, so if you want to highlight a verse for this lesson, it would be 10.15. That's the key verse. 10.15 gives you the concept of phronimas, but everything in front of it and everything behind it helps to define it. So we will look at our recall triad next and uh, our four-point focus.